I should probably paint something with Space Marines at some point, shouldn't I? Fine. I want some more items to be able to decorate the background and the set here. They don't have to be 40K related, but I did notice that online, the Primaris McFarlane Hellblaster toy was going for only $10, and that was a steal. I had to pick one up. This is going to be my first Space Marine that I've painted in about 20 years. So let's have some fun with it. I'm pretty sure that the model would have mold release agents still on it that could make it tricky for the paints to stick. So I'll have to give it a bath. We can probably spice up this bath footage though. Ah yes, cleanse for the Emperor, Brother Rubix and Brother Aracuda. This sucker has mold lines, so take the time before we paint to remove the more obvious ones around the helmet, the arms, legs and the weapon. I'll be leaving the backpack and weapon separate for ease of painting, but I'm not going to the length of breaking apart the rest of the model because I know I'll stuff it up and I'm going to bring an abrupt end to the video if I do. This is such a handy hobby tool. It's a rechargeable battery operated hand drill and you can use it for drilling holes for magnets, drilling out gun barrels or for inflicting damage on models. It's called the WOW Stick, so you can search for it online and then sift through the dozens of adult toys that will inevitably fill the first page of your results. I'm using it to drill a couple of bullet holes from where the evildoers wanted to alert this particular marine of their heresy. I need to pick out a chapter and a paint scheme for my space marine. As a kid when I first got into the hobby, I collected blood angels. I wish I still had the models to show you because boy was it a bad paint job. It was this thick, red automotive primer that I got from a hardware shop. It went on so heavy it covered all the detail and it smelt like burning. Man, what a time to be alive. What was I talking about? Blood Angels. Now I know it's probably one of the most popular chapters, but this could be a cool nostalgic hobby moment for me where I have one sitting on the shelf behind me, which is no doubt gonna have to be better than the ones I had as a kid. Starting dark then with a black primer. This should help me get some nicer, deeper, dark shadows on him under the arms and in any of those recess spots. I normally get straight into my colours, but I see other artists online that put a coat of another black over the top of a spray can primer. So I'm doing that. Am I mad? It feels like a hat on a hat moment. Oh well. Mixing together a combination of two parts black, one part corn red and one part purple gives me a nice dark shadow colour. I don't need to mask off any areas throughout this process because areas that I accidentally overspray are going to be brush painted later. Under the arms, inside the legs, I'm picturing the light coming from above to keep it simple so anything on an underside can have a spray. Each time I have to talk myself into using darker paints and remember that when I use a bright colour as a highlight then it will come to life. So I'm working my way up now with corn red. If ever you get stuck, my trick is to picture each part of the model as its own shape and then tackle that piece on its own. Now this is a big model. You can certainly paint it by brush, but I think you will save yourself a boatload of time with an airbrush. Don't go purchasing an airbrush and all the gear just for one model to sit on your study shelf though. Ask around your hobby group and your other dorky mates and one of them will have one. Remember they're used for other hobbies, so someone's partner might have one for painting fancy fingernails or something. I pretended I wanted to borrow one to work on a sweet muscle car restoration project because I'm so manly. Heaven forbid someone ask any sort of follow up question. Ah oh yeah, it's for the 1969 Dodge Ferrari Signature Series. You've probably never heard of it. Mephiston Red is next. This is the red red, the middle of my brightness. If an armour panel will be completely red, then this layer is only going over roughly the top third of it leaving our darker ones below and offering a little room for our brighter ones to come. I don't completely clean out the airbrush when I'm transitioning colours like this because having some of the previous one mixed in there will actually help with each layer blending smoothly. Evil Sun Scarlet is next. If you don't have these exact paints, don't wig out. Have a look at what similar colours you have and what ones you can create. Don't add whites though to your reds in the hopes of making them brighter as they're just going to turn pink. The final highlight from the airbrush will be a 50-50 mix of Evil Sun Scarlet and Troll Slayer Orange. 
and this has been applied in small amounts to the most raised sections. I think he's looking pretty cool. The airbrush work is done, it's time to head upstairs. There's some more work to do with the red armour at the darkest and the brightest ends. To start with, I'm painting black in the scratches and bullet holes as well in each of the armour panel lines. Thin brush, taking my time and wiping away any mistakes. I want the armour to have been battle tested, so I'm going to apply a chipping effect by dipping some packing foam into brown paint and then lightly dabbing onto the edges of the armour and places where it's been crashing into debris. Orange will be the edge highlight colour and I'm selecting Troll Slayer Orange again. I'm following the raised edges of the armour panels. The damage will stand out now and look 3D as a thin orange highlight is added. Follow the underside of the brown chipping. Yes! Okay, cool. This is what I wanted, it's looking good so far. I'm going to get most of these boring metal parts out of the way with simple tactics because I'm already looking ahead to the next part I want to tackle. I'm using Vallejo Gunmetal Silver because it's amazing and yeah I'm a little sad that it took me so many years to discover it, so what? A layer of this on areas such as knee and elbow joints, the inside of the gloves, the backpack and any parts of the weapon we want to be metal. Done. I'm washing with Null Oil so that the areas stay nice and dark and then I'll come back later on and hit them with an edge highlight of a bright silver when I remember. The helmet and a panel on the backpack are going to be black. A couple of thin coats of Abaddon Black here. There's no shading with washes because we can't get any darker than the black we have. With a model this large, I want to challenge myself in areas that I wouldn't usually give that much attention, maybe because I'm not as confident. The helmet is going to be a focal point for people looking at the model. So this is an area that I probably don't have an excuse now not to put some more time and effort in and try and make it look good. Amazing miniature painter Darren Latham recently shared his guide to painting a skull onto the helmet of a space marine. Now that I'm benefiting from having the larger model, this is something I want to try out. I'm sketching an outline with Zandru dust to get the shape of the skull. I still have black paint on my palette so I can tidy up the lines as I go. I create a glaze for the shadow areas using a slightly darker brown and some thinner. For the raised lighter areas, I'm working my way through colours like Yushabti Bone, Screaming Skull and then a white. I'm wet blending black to light blue for the eye lenses and adding a couple of white dots. Then I'm going to finish with a gloss. I can comfortably say that this is the first time I've actually painted eyes without losing my mind. When I highlight black armour, I like to use blues instead of grey and white. Each of these layers are painting on similar to edge highlights, but they start fat and work their way thinner and sharper as I progress. Incubi Darkness is first, and you see the difference from the black is quite subtle. I think the helmet, the black backpack panel, and the casing of the plasma weapon will be enough black sections on the model to break up from all the red. Thunderhawk Blue is next, and I'm catching around half of the previous area. Then finally, Fenrisian Grey for the thin edges. Okay, this is it. This is the part of the video that I'm most nervous about. I'm worried that I'm about to ruin the whole model because I want to try and paint non-metallic metal for the first time. Probably picked a better model to do it on because it's larger, but also I'm this far in and I'm nervous that I'm just going to ruin it. Rhinox Hide is the brown base coat that I'm starting with and my goal is to paint the chest symbol as well as both trims on the shoulder pauldrons. Zumiko, Squidma, Miniac and Ninjin each have tutorials that vary a little and use different colours. This is good and bad for me. It lets me know that there's multiple ways you can attack it, but also means that I'll fall somewhere in the middle of a few different styles. I'm taking their advice and focusing on contrast from dark browns all the way to white, and I'm trying to achieve smooth gradients by using glazing techniques. The four colours I'm using are Rhinox Hide from GW and then three Vallejo colours being Scrupulous Brown, Sun Yellow and Off-White. There are GW and other brand variants for each of these, so use what you have on hand. 
I'm using four paints, but I'm mixing each of the colors to create transition colors to help me achieve a smoother blend. I can see what they're talking about in their videos now. When I'm painting the red armor, I transition from dark red to orange, and I feel like that's a pretty dramatic shift. However, here I'm going from a very dark brown through yellows all the way to white in a short amount of model. The shoulders are going to be a challenge for me because I can't hide behind the texture and shape like I could with the chest symbol. Here I've tried to focus on another key principle that the artists talk about, which is having secondary reflections. So rather than one point which is bright, here there's going to be second and third areas which are shiny, but not as bright. I'm speeding through the leather pouches using a couple of browns and painting with small scratching style brush strokes to give the impression of texture. But I'm mindful that these are hidden on the back of the model so I don't want to get lost here. There we go, I finally remember to highlight my silver edges. In one of my previous videos, I converted a Warhammer Plus model into an Orc Big Mech. In that one, I had a go at OSL lighting, but I rushed it a little. I mentioned then that I'd love to have a future crack at redemption, and today's gonna to be that opportunity as I have another go at OSL. In the past, my method of painting OSL is just to use the airbrush, and I spray the same GW paints through in brighter colors in an area to make it look like that's where the light is, but today I wanna to try something new. El Miniaturista and the Source Painting are two amazing painters that use a different method, I want to have a look at theirs and see how easy it will be to adopt and use on this model. I'll be using Liquitex acrylic inks instead of standard paints. The idea here is that rather than covering an area with a colour of paint, I'll instead be adding a tinting layer. This is nerve wracking because I feel as though if I make a mistake, my goose is cooked and there's no holding down Ctrl Z to wind back the clock. I'm painting titanium white ink across the whole plasma coil area. With ink, it will settle into those recess areas and leave some of the black showing on the coils. This is a win. It will show that the hottest areas are in the core of the weapon. Next, I'm using the airbrush and I'm spraying the white ink in areas around the weapon where I believe the light glow will be cast. I'm not brave enough to go crazy on my first attempt, so I'll be picking areas on the plasma gun casing, the marine's left arm, the chest, and the left shoulder. My goal is to have some bright areas around the edges and then have the white fade away. I'm coming back with the brush now and painting some of the white ink as an edge highlight on the sharp edges. How do you pick a plasma glow color for your model or for your army? What I'd suggest is before you put paint to model or before you even buy any paints is jump online and have a look at all the different artwork and all the pictures that are on GW's site. You'll probably end up finding a color that you hadn't even considered. It'll look really good for your theme. I found this really hard to pick a plasma glow color to go with the red armor. I had my heart set on green and then my wife told me it looked like Christmas and I couldn't unsee it. I asked a few different mates and they all gave different answers. It's probably a good thing. It means that no matter what, you can't go wrong. Alternatively, it means that no matter what you do, everyone's gonna hate it. I hope that helps. Anyway, I selected blue. I thought it would be a nice variation to the red armor and it would complement the blues in the Marine's eyes and the black armor highlights. The hard work is already done with the white. So now I take my time and spray the ink over the top of the areas where I've already placed that white ink down. It's important here to make sure that you're selecting an ink which is semi-transparent or transparent. It tells you whether it's semi-transparent or opaque in the product description online or on the side of the bottle. I had an extra week's wait here after the first bottle arrived and realized I bought an opaque one. I'm using some airbrush flow improver as a thinner, just to create some more transparency in the ink as well. I'm coming back in at the end and adding a little more of the white ink in the recess of the coils down the bottom where I want it to look like it's glowing proper hot. What do you think of this OSL glowing method? Would you like to see a video where I use this ink shading method to paint some space marines?
I'm calling him finished. Really happy with this. The model was a lot of fun to paint and trying new techniques on a larger scale model was a good idea for me. The principles that these artists talk about just seem to make more sense when I have more space to work with on the model. And check this out, goal achieved. Now I've got another item to be part of the backdrop. So anyway, I have a second model because I couldn't help myself and I bought two, but I have no idea what to do with it. Should I paint it up as well and add it to the back shelf or should I paint it for someone else? Let me know. The channel is still growing and your contributions with likes and comments are making a huge difference. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to subscribe, you're welcome to. And there's another video you can check out as well. Can't wait to see you on the next one. Thanks again.